ITU Youth Championship. He won the ITU Under 23 Championship, two-time ITU World Champion, and in 2012, he won the gold medal in the Olympics. Please give it up for Mr. Alistair Brownlee. Yo, there he is. Yeah. Alistair, grab your seat there, bud. You're one of those guys who has been in this sport forever and ever. What was your, what was your first sport? What did you get into when you were like, what, four, five, six years old? Uh, well, my mum was a swimmer, um, so she took me down to the swimming pool. I got involved in that very early on, probably a five or six-year-old. My dad was quite into running, so he would take us to running races, school cross-country races, local fell races, all sorts of that kind of thing. Um, and then quickly got involved in triathlon as well as about an eight and nine year old. So, so tell, tell us, what is fell running? Um, fell running is just, you might call it hill running or mountain running. It's like cross country running, but up a hill. Um, where I live in Northern England, there's quite a, a lot of local races where you literally just stood in a muddy field at the bottom of a hill somewhere. And some old guy says, right, it's the first one to get to the top of that hill and back. And so it's quite a fun introduction to sport and um, like it's it's a ex professional sport, so there's a you know this difference between amateur and professional sport. And as a I don't know a ten year old kid, you could win two pounds, and at the time I thought that was amazing. That's about three or four dollars. So. <laughs> so you were a professional at nine years old, basically. <laughs> pretty, much, pretty much, yeah. <laughs> like that. And so you were nine years old. You ran in the lead schools cross country championship and finished four hundredth out of four hundred and fifty. And what I love is what you told your dad afterwards. Uh, you said, I think I'm a bit tubby to be a runner. I think I'll stop eating chips and pudding. So App apparently, yeah. I don't remember this event. Uh, I, rem I remember running in the cross-country race, definitely. That wasn't a pleasant experience at all. Uh, I don't know why I continued. Um, but I think I was even younger than nine, actually, maybe eight. And yeah. y you did it as an under-11 age bracket, and I did it for three years. And I just every time I did it, well, it was 10 races a year, I tried to be better than I was before, so um, I got from 400th to about 5th, I think, by the time I'd finished it. <laughs> so your first, your first introduction to triathlon, when did you first see the sport? Uh, I first saw the sport, I had an uncle who was quite into it, um, and he was at the time training, trying to do an Ironman's qualifier for Kona, um, and I went to watch him at a couple of races one summer, um, and I'd, about a similar time I decided to give it a go as well. And um, did a children's race in Nottingham in the UK. So when you watched your uncle do the race, what type of what, what type of venue was it? It sounds like it was a pretty brutal event. Yeah, he um, it was something called the Yorkshire Dales Triathlon that doesn't actually exist anymore as it was. Um, but it, it's kind of a weird race that wasn't necessarily kind of a triathlon triathlon. It was kind of a more of a challenge kind of thing. It wasn't even under British Triathlon Association rules, but he did it, and everyone in the local area did it every year. It was a fantastic event. Um, and you swim in this lake that's in the absolute middle of nowhere um, for British standards, not by American standards. Um, and, and, but straight out of this lake, there's a hill that's 25%. And so I remember as being an a eight-year-old kid or however old I was standing on this hill and seeing people not getting on the bikes and having to push it up and snapping chains and coming to problems with the crossbar and all sorts. And um, yeah, that, that was my introduction to triathlon, I think. And you just still decided that you wanted to do it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that, that was it. That made me want to do it. If I hadn't been stood on that hill, I don't know, it could have been so much different. <laughs> if you were here in San Diego and it was sunny and warm, you would have been, ah, I'm going to go find another sport. Yeah, probably. It probably wouldn't have had the appeal, would it? <laughs> <laughs> so what did you think of your first visit here to San Diego, getting that this is the birthplace of triathlon? Did you, did you enjoy yourself? Uh, yeah, I have enjoyed it. Um, you know, obviously, I've heard a lot about San Diego from being a, a young age and, and triathlon here. Um, and it, it kind of feels weird that I've actually never been to California or the West Coast in all my career so far. So it's actually nice to come. Um, it's normally racing this time of year is a bit early for me. So I decided to do something a bit different this year. I, and it, I've actually been here for two weeks training just up the coast in Cardiff. And I've I really enjoyed that. It's been good. So you're, you're doing triathlon starting when you're a young guy. When did you get to the point where you felt like this is something that, that I want to do seriously? It was a, definitely a gradual progression, um, going all the way through my school years. I mean, sport was definitely what I wanted to do. It's what I love doing. 
um, and really enjoyed, but I was kind of more about the academic side of my study. Um, and I gradually kind of got better and better. I went to my first world championship as a junior in 2005. Um, I, I was still a young junior then in Japan and came about 50th, had an absolute shocking race. Uh, absolutely terrible. And that kind of motivated me to go away, train a little bit harder, I think, and be a bit more serious. And, and then that next year in 2006, um, I won the world junior championships. And, and that was a big kind of tur turning point for me because I suddenly thought, you know, maybe I can be a professional athlete, maybe I can do well at this sport triathlon and uh, kind of commit to it. Um, that was definitely a, an important kind of turning point. So at that point, did you start thinking Olympics, knowing that at that, did you know that at that point that uh, London was going to be hosting the Games in 2012? Well, I remember it got announced actually that London were holding the Games in 2005. So that was the year before that. Um, and I remember being at school when it was announced and the teacher saying, oh, isn't it fantastic? And I, at the time, I thought, yeah, it's a million miles away from me. I'm never going to make it to the Olympics or to that level. So, you know, it's fantastic, but, um, yeah, it's nothing to do with me whatsoever. Um, <laughs> but, but slowly, you know, I kind of by 2006, I'd actually I'd done junior races, but some senior races. And I thought, actually, I'm not that far off qualifying for the Olympics. Maybe I could sneak into Beijing. So it was starting to come my kind of horizons a little bit more. Right. So you do qualify to go to Beijing. And in Beijing, I think I remember you were off the front a little bit in the run. You, you, you took a little flyer off the front, ended up 12th. But you had to be happy with the way you raced, and for, especially for your first time. How old were you in the Olympics? Um, I was 20 in Beijing. Um, I hadn't really expected to qualify, and I thought I had an outside chance. Um, turned up at the qualification race and, and had a great race with first Brit, which qualified me. Um, and at the time, I was had come third in that race after Gomez. Um, and... I, I, fantastic, you know, I got to the Olympics, I couldn't ask for any more, that's absolutely brilliant. I'd come 12th in the European champs a couple of weeks before, um, and I thought, yeah, you know, top 20 in the Olympics, that's fantastic, what a, what a fantastic experience it'll all be, it's just wonderful. And then by the time I kind of went on the next training camp, I was like, I could get top 10 in the Olympics. Anyway, by the time I stood on the start line, I thought I was going to win the thing. Even, <laughs> even, <laughs> even though I had, I had no chance of winning it whatsoever, um, but I was determined to give it a good go. And so I couldn't believe it. I, I got off my bike and I just thought, wow, I'm feeling so good. Absolutely brilliant until I got to about 6K. And then I pretty much had to walk to the finish. So <laughs> it became survival rather than getting there as fast as possible. But you went for it, which is, which is really what it's all about. Absolutely, yeah. I, I went for it um, and you know, was competitive for those 6 or 7K. And I, I thought my first kind of um, feelings when I crossed the finish line was what have you done you idiot you know you were winning the Olympics 10 minutes ago and now you're finished you come 12 <laughs> now, that, that's a that's a pretty pretty rapid demise and um and, and it took me about half an hour and I kind of gradually came around to the fact that 12 in Olympics was a, a very very big step forward it was far better you know I'd, that earlier in that year I'd come 12th in the European champ so it was big progress so when you look at 2009, to me, that's the big breakthrough year. I think you won you know, four ITU events, win the world championships. Mm -hmm. Was there something that you did differently over the winter leading into that year? Did you surprise yourself how well you did in 2009? Uh, massively. Um, I think the big thing was that, like, like I just talked about, you know, I'd been competitive for 7K of that run, whatever, 95% yeah. of the race. And that you know suddenly I, I was there you know I'm not actually that far off winning these races and doing really well so that gave me a little bit of belief and motivation to go away and train hard and I think that was very important um the difference between a 20 year old and being a 21 year old is quite big as well I think growing a bit older getting a bit stronger as well had a big effect and just having a good solid winters of a winter of training I uh, that year um I had a bit of the post Olympic whatever and stopped stopped my season very early but then I started my off season training very early and just had a really good uh, block of training, I think, and that was really important. Were you also going to school at the same time, getting your degree? Yeah, I was at that time. Um, I was studying for a university degree. Uh, not studying particularly hard, but I was, <laughs> I was getting it done. <laughs> in what? Sports, sports science and yeah, physiology? Yeah, sports science and physiology, yeah. And you're, are you in school now, too? Uh, no, I've just finished a second and master's degree in finance. Good man. <laughs> so you know how to invest your money. That's good. <laughs> So when did Johnny get into this stuff? Did he, your brother Johnny, did he get into it pretty much the same time you did? or he, he, Yeah, he, very similar. Um, basically, if I was going to swimming club, then it'd be like, Alistair's going to swimming club, Johnny, you've got to come. Um, you can't be left, <laughs> you've got, you've got to be, can't be left at home alone. And then it'd be like, 
Alistair's going to running club. Come on, Johnny, you've got to come. <laughs> and Johnny hated it at first, actually. He even used to hide his swimming bag because he didn't want to go. <laughs> um, <laughs> he hated it that much. <laughs> That's funny. Um, and, and then, obviously, he came to triathlon. And, um, yeah, now he, he's the opposite. He's the one who's always there first. So it's funny, really. <laughs> that is funny. And did he, did he hate running, too, or mainly it was swimming? No, he, um, well, he didn't necessarily hate it, but Johnny was, I, my passion was always endurance sports. Yeah. Because um, that's what I always loved doing. I loved running um, from even being an 11-year-old. You know, I loved going out running. Um, and that was really important to me. Johnny liked everything else. He liked football, cricket, rugby. So he did literally every sport under the sun. So he was kind of balancing lots of sports and didn't quite have the same uh, focus on that, which then he found a bit later on. So have you ever, has he ever beaten you in a race? Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, he's beaten me in lots of races. Um, just thankfully not the important ones yet. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remind him of that every once in a while? Uh, yeah, not too often. I don't want to upset him. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, on, after you win, a, after you, in 2009, uh, things are, you're, you're cranking, you have that phenomenal year, you start to get some, again, in England, um, the triathlon is still not the biggest sport around, right? There's everything else is so much more important. Chrissy Wellington did, doing well created a lot of interest. But did you start to get more recognition after the 2009 season with the Olympics looming? Yeah, definitely. Um, that was a big turning point. And the Olympics is absolutely massive. You know, in triathlon, Olympic distance triathlon, obviously, the Olympics is a step above everything else. And then the fact that it was a home Olympics in London, um, that was fantastic. And, and actually in 2009, one of the race, I can't remember, I think it was the fourth race of the series was actually in London, mm -hmm. in Hyde Park on the course. Um, and I'd already won three races in the lead up to that. And suddenly overnight, I'm kind of aware that people are saying, yeah, this guy could win a gold medal in four years time. And that, you know, that changes your status straight away. People are interested in the story, sponsors, everything else. So. In some ways, it was very good because I had to cope with that pressure there and then. Um, you know, people were already putting expectations on and I had to go out and cope with it. Um, but, you know, in other ways, it was tough as well. So most of the people in this room are, tri are Ironman folks, non-drafting folks. So we, you know, we look at the I2 style of racing or used to look at the I2 style of racing. We'd watch it on TV and see people hammering the swim running sub 30 minutes off the bike and it looked like a group ride a lot of times on the ride but you've changed that it seems because uh talking to chris mccormick who went back to short course last year and he was talking about that alistair brownlee I, I love racing with him because he's yelling at everybody if you don't get up here and take a pull jan for dano get the hell out of here i mean do you did you feel that 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 that's the sport has changed that the I2 style has become more of a, a great bike race as well as a very fast swim and run? Yeah, I think it's getting there. And I think there always was races that were pretty tough. Um, obviously, it's very, very course dependent. Right. Um, you know, on some courses where you get wide roads, it's hard to split it up because not much can happen. Um, and I think that's something that the ITU are actually getting a, a little bit better at, kind of creating courses that uh, provide good racing because that's very, very important. Um, I think attitudes as well, you know, I'd never quite understand why if you're a guy who's probably going to run 32 minutes on that day, why aren't you attacking on the bike? Because, you know, that's your chance to win um, or, you know, or you're fast out the swim and fast onto the bike. That's your chance to do well. So I think those attitudes are changing a little bit and that's very important. Um, and it's just getting that little bit more competitive as well, I think. You know, people are making the most of those opportunities, learning how to ride a bit better, a bit tactically better as well. But, uh, yeah, there's definitely still a long way to go. Well, it's interesting, Javier Gomez was with us a couple of weeks ago, and he talked about how the London race in 2011, the ITU race, you guys went about 150, mm -hmm. and a year later, even though that, that year it was raining a little bit, but in the Olympics, you guys went 146, averaged 44K an hour on the bike, mm -hmm. and ran, you ran 2907, he ran 2915. Mm -hmm. So things changed a lot. Yeah, the London race in 2011 was very... He might, I went a bit faster than him there, actually. I was, um, Did you? Yeah, he, uh, it was a very funny race. I think because the tactics, um, everyone was trying to qualify for the Olympics, so a lot of people were watching each other. Um, and I actually got off the front in a breakaway with three of the guys, and it was still a really slow race, so I shouldn't have been really pulling away from the field at all. And on a course like London with wide open roads, a small group shouldn't 
have any chance against a big group behind them. But we managed to get away, and, and that was because that big group behind were all watching each other. It was very cagey. Um, and then the Olympics was just a much faster race. Um, right. we, we purposely tried to make it very, very fast from the start. And then, you know, with the, with the tactics of using domestiques and stuff, it, it stayed on being very, very fast through the well, whole race. Talk a little bit about that, because you had, was it Stuart Hayes, who was your sort of domestique? But so in the, in the London race, which, you know, leading into that race, like you said, they started talking about you four years out. Well, in the months leading in, there's billboards, there's buses, there's TV commercials. That's a lot of pressure on a guy who's still, what, 23, 24 years old. Did you and Johnny both feel that pressure? Because people basically in, in England were saying, we're pretty much guaranteed we'll have two medals in triathlon. Uh, yeah, they were. Um, and in some ways, it was a bit overwhelming sometimes, uh, seeing your faces everywhere and, uh, and so on and so forth. But I think there was, for me definitely, there was a few moments where I kind of realized, actually, it's not necessarily about the pressure. You know, these hundreds of thousands of people haven't turned up today for pressure. You know, they just turned up to support you, and that's fantastic, you know. And so you can kind of turn it into a positive, and that's what I did. Um, my coach was always telling me that pressure is it's an honor and a privilege, and you've earned it, and that means... You know, you've got, the, you've got the pressure because you're the best person in the race. So that's a, another good way of looking at it. But mostly, I think we just dealt with it by thinking, right, it's like the same as any other race. And, and our, kind of, our kind of mantra through the whole thing, we're just trying to make it like any other ITU race that we turn up and race five or six times a year. And, and that's what we did. To the extent, actually, it, it was only once across the line, I thought, oh, wow, that was the Olympics. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> so I, I think that works quite well, actually. <laughs> So a lot of triathletes leave their homes during the winter and they go and train in, you know, Lanzarote, they go train in warm spots. You guys live in, what, Yorkshire, and I've seen the video and you're out there bundled up and it, you think that training, you know, making training hard, dealing with the conditions helps you to perform on race day because you're pretty much ready for anything. I think dealing with the conditions maybe has a small effect. Um, to be honest, it's not like we go out purposely training in really bad weather or we actually avoid bad weather a lot of the time. <laughs> um, <laughs> we're just sitting inside looking at the weather forecasting when it's going to stop raining. Um, but I think that the more important thing is if, it's, if it is kind of tough and it's hard, you've got to really want to do it and you've got to be really motivated and you've got to really love it to go out there and do it. And um, I think that's very, very important. Um, and as a, you know, Mark Cavendish, the cyclist, he always talks about this a lot. He's fantastic. And he's from a, an island off the coast of Britain where it rains all the time and it's always windy and there's only about three roads. And he says, yeah, th this little place has so many great cyclists because, yeah, you've got to absolutely love cyclists to cycle there because it's terrible. So, <laughs> island of man, yeah. Yeah, I think it's probably a good point. <laughs> that is a great point. Uh, Chris McCormick, who spoke to this group a number of times, he, you know, he talked again about you and Johnny and how tough you were, but he also said that uh, he learned a lot uh, about himself because when he came back, he realized that he can't play at that game anymore. That he, here, I think last year he, was, he ran 31.30 off the bike and finished 50th, something along that line. So wh what were your thoughts about having someone like Maka come back to ITU? Because I think it, it gave ITU a lot of credibility, have an Ironman guy come over there who's a champion and really get schooled by you guys. Yeah, for yeah, from my point of view, obviously it's fantastic. He did it and didn't do very well. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, but you know, I think most of it, we probably could have predicted it, and I think he probably could have predicted it a fair amount as well. To be honest, um, it's not only the fact that I think the sport has got that little bit faster in the time that he's been doing Ironman. Um, I'm sure he might got a bit slower as well. I don't know. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, and it is—it's just so different. Um, you know, it's a completely different type of racing, a different style, even even different to obviously the longer stuff that he does. But you know, different in terms of the sport that he did in ITU racing ten years ago. I think. Right. So talk a little bit about last a year ago. A year ago, your brother won here mainly because you were home dealing with an Achilles issue. And you're talking not, what, nine, ten months before the Olympics, you're in a cast with, uh, for three weeks with an Achilles issue. How concerned were you about being able to come back and potentially even get to the Olympics? Obviously very concerned. Um, yeah, there was a couple of points, obviously, which are a lot worse than any others. Um, the first was being told you've got a tear in your Achilles, you're going to have to be in a cast for three or four weeks. That's a nightmare. That was in early February, about the 10th of February, so, and the Olympics is in August, so it's not an awful lot of time to go. 
so that was a nightmare. And then it actually healed quite well, so I got the cast off after three weeks rather than four. And I, as I kind of got back into training about two weeks after, it started swelling up again, and I thought, oh, no, I've done it again. And obviously at that, at that point, if you have done it again, that's it, game over, you've got no chance. Um, so that was a really, really worrying period. But after that, once... Um, once the Achilles is healed and I could get on and train, it was fantastic. I think with a, if I've ever learned anything from injuries, it's, you know, just whatever you do, get the injury better first and then worry about training because, you know, you, half training does no one any favours, really. You're far better off just resting, getting it sorted and then absolutely smashing it. So you come back to Kitzbühel is your first race back. And I'm sure a lot of guys at that point were thinking, OK, we're going to find out what type of shape this guy is in. Because you know it's not that far before the Olympics, and I'm thinking in your head you're you're sort of wanting to make a statement that okay, this is the guy who's going to win the gold medal, and the rest of you guys can worry about silver and bronze. How important was that race for you to really perform well? It was very very important, um, completely um, well only for my personal point of view. Really, you know, I only had six weeks to the Olympics. I knew I could do a fair amount in six weeks, but you know you can't change the world in six weeks. So. I had to be in fairly decent shape, and um, I'd done probably about two months of really good training into that. So the most important thing was I was just looking forward to a rest. Uh, I trained really, really hard, and I thought, right, yeah, go to Kitzbühel, see how it goes. Um, but there was also other things riding on it. You know, if I had a really bad race, I could have potentially got deselected from the Olympic team. So there was quite a lot of pressure there, both externally and internally for me. Um, and it couldn't, gone, it couldn't have gone any better at all, really. Um, I didn't really know how it was going to go, and the whole whole race was absolutely fantastic. And you won by, what, about 50 seconds or something like that? Yeah, it was, it was a big margin, and um, I was thinking on the run, because, you know, quite often, if you start getting 20-second gaps, you kind of ease off. Um, you know, no one's that sadist that they're going to push themselves and push themselves just to win by further. Um, but in Kitzbühel, I thought, right, whatever happens, I'm going to run as hard as I possibly can and get to the finish line. Um, because I want people to look at that time and go, flipping hell, that was ridiculous. Um, <laughs> but it's six weeks before the Olympics, and so there's quite a lot of you know, things going on. And yeah, so I, I literally probably couldn't have run a second faster there, I don't think, on that day. So would you rather have two years of a career where you just win everything or ten years of good performances but not great? Oh, two years every time. Two Definitely, years of yeah. just being the best and dominating. Definitely, yeah. And then spend the other eight in a pub somewhere. Because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I see that you had, you had the Achilles thing last year. You had a uh, you know, stress fracture in your femur. You've had some pretty major injuries, but I'm assuming a lot of that comes from training hard. Yeah, definitely. Um, and it is a, it's a kind of conscious decision I've made. I know for a fact that... I could probably do a little bit less training, uh, train a little bit differently, and maybe not be quite as good. Um, and uh, and who knows? But uh, yeah, for me, it's all about kind of pushing myself a lot of the time, seeing how much I can train, see how much I can push that out, and um, seeing how good you can kind of be. That's what sports about, really. I think. And um, yeah, that's what I want to do. If I if something happens and you break your leg tomorrow, it could happen from training hard or from a car, couldn't it? So I think right. you've got you got to make the most of it while you've got it. Just go for it. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> so from 2005 to 2010, you raced in 31 ITU events, top 10, 24 times out of 31. 13 gold, five silvers, two bronze. Now, this is just up through 2010. That's, that's some consistency. That's pretty amazing. Yeah, I, I think the difference actually between Johnny and me is I race well or I race absolutely terribly. If you look at that, there'll be some 50ths and 40ths in there. And Johnny doesn't have any bad races. He, he's got something like... 36 podiums in a row. He, ha he hasn't been off a podium in any race since mid-2010 or something. It's absolutely ridiculous. So, speaking of ridiculous, 2011, June, 21 days, you won ITU races in Madrid and Kitzbühel, and then you flatted during the European Championships, uh, lost 30 seconds, still ran your way through the field for the gold in the European Championships. That's all in 21 days. That's pretty impressive. Yeah, that was, um, the European Champs actually was a really great race that year. Um, I flatted, got to the wheel stop, uh, put, got to the wheel and found that someone hadn't put a skewer in the spare wheel. You're thinking, flipping hell. Uh, this <laughs> one, and uh, could this get any worse? So I had to take my skewer out, put it in, chase back on. Um, and then thankfully, it was, a, it was a kind of a Great Britain initi initiative. So there was a lot of team racing going on. So Johnny slowed the front pack down, which meant that it didn't go anywhere. And I had people to help me chase back up. But... That was definitely one of those days that I couldn't have done without a, a team. If that had happened, you know, this last weekend, you would have no chance at all, to be honest. 
Well, and then you, when Javier Gomez was here the other day, we were talking about this, but in, uh, you and Javier have been in the same races, IT races, 21 times, yeah, counting yesterday, and 19 times either you or Javier has won the race. I mean, what type of relationship do you have with Javi? And I mean, because one of you guys is going to win, right? So how do you, and you guys are on the same, aren't you on the same French team? Uh, you were on the same French team for a while? Yeah, we are, yeah. Um, I suppose we're kind of friendly. Um, <laughs> 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 although, yeah, we're probably not going to go on holiday together. Um, <laughs> um, no, we're good. I think we have a lot of mutual respect. Um, you know, we've raced each other a lot now for a long time. Uh, had some very very hard races and some very very close races and it's you know been fantastic yeah we both race for a french team called sartreville which is just outside paris um and so we've raced as a team together as well you know tactically which has been fantastic um yeah we, french racing is really good for that kind of thing so you and uh, on race morning you and johnny i assume are staying in the same place and so what you when you guys get up on race morning in the olympics Olympic morning, what do you guys, any, what's the conversation that morning? Because it's not just another day. No, um, it's weird waking up Olympic morning, you know, I kind of wake up and you just expect to be so nervous. And I woke up and I didn't feel bad at all. And um, I think Johnny, we were staying in a hotel near Hyde Park, not in the Olympic Village. And I, Johnny was in the hotel room next to me and I knocked on his door and went in and he was just sat on the bed. And it was like a, a BBC news story of how many thousands of people were turning up in Hyde Park with flags to watch us. And uh, Johnny, <laughs> Johnny, Johnny's just sat on the edge of the bed going, flipping hell, you know, we better not mess up here. And because, uh, you know, as the news, you know, saying, oh, you know, thousands of people are here with Yorkshire flags and Brownlee flags. And, uh, and that, that was actually one of those moments where we were both like, you know, this is fantastic. People are here just to support us. And, um, you know, it's not about the pressure. They just want you to do well, which is, you know, a good positive force, really. So Richard Varga takes out the swim, and then your teammate Stuart Hayes is out there to you know to basically help a little bit on the bike. Um, your Johnny gets a penalty, and you know that he's got to go in the penalty box sometime during the run for 15 seconds, the four lap run. Did you guys say anything, knowing that hey, if we can get a gap here, if you and I and Javier can get a gap on the rest of the field, you can take that 15 seconds and still get a, a medal. How did you, how did you play that out, knowing that? Johnny had to do a penalty at some point. Yeah, absolutely. Um, th the course was so loud for most of it that we couldn't hear each other speak. So there was only a, a small 100-meter section as you go across where the swim was in the serpentine where you could actually hear each other because the crowds were five it or six deep. It was ridiculous. Crazy. Had you ever been yeah. in, in front of any type of crowd yeah. like that before? No, never. And I don't think... I think triathlon will struggle to ever achieve those kind of crowds again, to be honest, because the central London kind of Hyde Park, I think it's a great venue for it, but... Um, the, the, just the general interest that was generated, I think, around the triathlon is fantastic. But yeah, so we had maybe like a, a 10 second slot where you could talk to him every lap. And so on one lap, he's like, lots of swear words, I've got a penalty. And, like, <laughs> and the next lap, I'm like, so you've got whatever about 6K to think what I'm going to say to him. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's all right, Johnny, you'll be fine. Um, and then it's another 6K. <laughs> and then, and I was like, yeah, we just got to, I've thought about it. You just got to run as hard as you can. And that was basically it then. And we both said, good luck. And, and that was it. We, uh, and yeah, I, I did think tactically a lot, you know, what could I do? Is it better me taking the run out ridiculously fast for that first lap to see if we could drop everyone, including Gomez? Um, or is it better if we go, I go particularly slow and try some kind of tactic to let Johnny go? Or, and I just thought, no, we just have to go for it and see what happens. And, um, and he, he was got told actually to take that penalty after the first lap, um, and he decided not to actually rightly then to take it on the third lap. Um, yeah, it sounds ridiculous. All these penalties, I agree. I think they are ridiculous. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so after three laps, he takes his penalty and is still able to get in third place and stay there. So. Well, yeah. Um, I think very, very early on that race became about the three of us. Really. Right. Um, after the first lap, after the first 2.5k, we had a 17-second lead. So. I was pretty confident there he was going to hold on for third, whatever. Um, and I think by the time he got up to that, the end of that third lap, he must have had a 40-second lead over fourth place. So he had quite a good barrier. So you come across the line, you wait for Javier. I don't have to wait long. Um, <laughs> we see 29.07, and we basically see you high-fiving, walking, jogging that last 150 yards. I mean, you seriously could have run sub-29 pretty easily. Do you kick yourself now or are you like, you know what, it's nice to celebrate that last part you, when you know you've got it? 
Yeah, I don't know. I, actually, I do. I mean, I think, wow, you know, if you had run a sub-29 in a triathlon, that's quite a mark um, and a fantastic thing to achieve. But I also think, you know, it's the Olympic gold. It's more than probable you're only going to do it once, especially, you know, it's in your home country. I think, you know, you can deserve to enjoy that last little bit as well. So, I don't know. I, I don't know either way. I don't regret it. And um, I probably wouldn't do it differently next time. But, yeah, you know, it would have been good to run a sub-29 as well. I actually... I've someone told me i didn't know until we were in the press conference and someone said do you realize you're on 2907 i was like nah the course was short and then uh, <laughs> and then <laughs> and then some some the race organizer was actually in the press conference like over here and he stood up he was like no the course wasn't short so <laughs> apparently <it was> <laughs> of course what's he gonna say yeah um uh, so you're on the medal stand they're gonna play the the anthem you said something to your brother what did you say to your brother um, well, Johnny collapsed after the race, and so the medal ceremony was delayed by about an hour because he'd, he'd, gone, oh, yeah. he'd gone so hard, and, and then he'd be in the medical tent. And so I was waiting around, thinking, you know, come on, I've got, I've got Olympic medal to get here, John. <laughs> and he's, he's, like, he's passed out somewhere. And um, so, to be honest, by the time we got to the medal ceremony, it was fantastic. But I think I was just saying, are you all right? Are you, you know, you, you're feeling all right because he looked like he was going to fall over again. I don't think. <laughs> but didn't you guys have something about seeing if, if the other guy was going to cry during the... Uh... Oh, yeah, we did actually, yeah. Yeah, that was our joke. We're saying, we were saying all the time, because we'd watched the Olympics sure. um, for the last... Well, we've always watched the Olympics, but it was about t uh, 10 days in. And so whenever anyone go out on the podium and cried, especially if we knew them and they were British, we were like, ah, oh, he's crying. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, uh, so we were hoping, so I was like, uh, we were saying to each other, you know, make sure you don't cry. And I was like, you're not going to cry, are you? You're not going to cry. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that's what you guys were doing. Uh, and then it's got to become a whirlwind after that. You're in, you know, this is your home country. You meet the queen. You go to Buckingham Palace. Take us through that, you know, after you win, what do you, what do you do? What 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 type of celebration <laughs> um, <laughs> that you can share? <laughs> <laughs> well, the it's a it's an absolute whirlwind after the Olympics. That is the way to describe it. Um, and I had all these images of thinking, yeah, you know, there's the the basketball final a couple of days after. I can go and watch that, and obviously watch the athletics every night, and maybe squeeze in a bit of track cycling and. Oh no, <laughs> I didn't get to watch anything. Um, it, but it, it's a fantastic experience in its own way. You know, doing probably 50 TV interviews in a row, um, just going up, the BBC is massive in Britain, so going on the sofa at the BBC, things like that, that was all fantastic. And, and that happens literally within hours of you crossing the line. Um, so the race was in the morning, I probably had drugs testing, all happened very, very fast, and I didn't get even back to my hotel till probably half 11 that night. Actually, it was just after 11 o'clock, because I came straight back from the BBC, went into the hotel, got changed, went straight to the nearest pub, I went in and ordered a drink. He said, sorry, mate, last orders, I can't serve you. I'm like, that's ridiculous. <laughs> I just won a gold medal. <laughs> well, and everyone was trying that one. He's like, nah, sorry, it doesn't matter. I can't serve you. So that was it. You couldn't even get a drink. <laughs> well, yeah, late. I went on later, but... Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Were you wearing the gold medal? Come on. No, definitely not, no. I, uh, I was so paranoid about losing it. I've never actually really been that bothered about... Um, winning medals, well, obviously winning them, but looking yeah. after them afterwards, um, it's the memory, it's what you do, it's not the object. Um, so, but the Olympic medal was a completely different story. I've been forever paranoid of losing the thing, so <laughs> I didn't take it anywhere with me. <laughs> you keep it in the safe deposit box, hopefully, keep it somewhere. It is now, yeah, yeah, it's safe now. Good, good. Um, your trip home, was it about a week later? You go home, helicopter, people waiting at the airport, that's got to be pretty cool. Yeah, that, that was absolutely mad. Um, we went down to London on our way down to London on the train and came back in a helicopter. I think that just describes how life changed in those few days. Um, it was, it was fantastic. But by that time, I'd done five or six days of just flat out meeting people, media commitments, and, um, and just to get home, actually, and just sit on my sofa was probably the best thing all week. It was just brilliant. <laughs> Uh, you mentioned uh, in some articles that if you travel to Australia or other places that are more triathlon hotbeds, like here in San Diego, people recognize you. But in, in around your area where you trained and lived, people really didn't know that much about triathlon. Has that changed a little bit since you won the gold medal? Uh, massively, yeah. I think it started to change early last year. Um, people's awareness of triathlon really increased. People would say, 
you know, good luck, or, you know, I'd be walking down the street to the shop and people would say, how's the Achilles? <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> um, so it changed massively and, uh, in the lead up to the Olympics, and then the Olympics kicked it off another level. Um, you know, it's done a massive amount for triathlon in Britain, without a doubt, and um, I think it will continue to do so. Next week, you're planning to run 10,000 on the track up at Stanford. Um, what are you thinking about? you have a goal time? What are you thinking about doing? Um, well, I wasn't really sure what kind of shape of him. I mean, I'd love to run as close to 28 as I could, I suppose, at some point, um, but I'm not quite sure at the moment. So uh, I'm hoping just to go out and hang on for as long as I can and see how well I do. Um, I initially wanted to look at qualifying for the Commonwealth Games, um, but they've just set the qualification time at 27.50, which is too fast for me. So <laughs> I'm not too worried about the time. I'm just going to go and see how it goes. Do you think that you, do you think your training for the, you know, for the 10,000 helped you yesterday? Have you been doing different running training to try to get ready for that? I haven't been doing too much different, actually. Okay. Um, I, I do quite a bit on the track every, anyway every week and some other running sessions, so uh, I haven't changed too much. But I think I've got a great opportunity this year to try some different things. Um, you know, I've done the World Series solidly for the last four years, so it's great just to try different things. I mean, I've always watched the race in Stanford and thought what a, it'd be fantastic to give it a go. So it just works nicely with being here and being able to go there next week. So I thought, why not give it a go? Speaking of giving it a go, any thoughts on a 70.3 or an Ironman or something? We talked actually on the radio that, boy, it's great that these guys, you know, Craig Alexander goes 803 when he's 39, 40 years old. Imagine if somebody at the height of their powers at 25, 26 came over to Kona and gave it a go how potentially fast you could go. Yeah, that, that's an interesting thing in Ironman, isn't it? Because a lot of these guys have had great ITU careers and then yeah. only, only move on afterwards. You know, if someone really focused on it early um, and hit it hard in their mid-20s, and um, it'd be interesting. You know, you see guys who, who are running the, winning the Olympic marathon now are in the early 20s, winning the Tour de France, and not necessarily that old either, which has changed in endurance sport terms. So right. who knows? Um, yeah, for me, I, absolutely. Yeah, I love triathlon. It's something I definitely want to do. Um, I definitely want to do another Olympics first, I think, um, before I kind of change my focus a little bit. But I think maybe there's a chance to squeeze in a 70.3 or two. Um, yeah. It's difficult, though, because all the, you know, everything's on a series now. If you want to do the ITU, you kind of have to do a series. If you want to uh, do high V, there's a series. If you want to race the 70.3, there's a flipping series. If you want to. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, there's only so many series you can fit in. <laughs> <laughs> so last year we had heard that you wanted to do Vegas, the 70.3 in Vegas. Was that something that you were serious about after the Olympics? Um, I was serious in wanting to do it, but not necessarily wanting to train to do it after the Olympics. Um, <laughs> I think, yeah, I, I would look, it, that is a thing that would fit in really well and I'd like to do actually at some point. Um, just obviously there's no chance of being able to qualify, of being right. able to qualification races to do it because... Yeah, with ITU racing and doing other things, you know, there's only so many times you can race in a year. But if somebody said to you, if the Ironman said, hey, we have a wild card for any gold medalists who mm. happen to be out there <laughs> would like to do 70.3 Las Vegas. Uh, yeah, I'd probably do it. If, when is it this year? I don't even know when it is. It is September oh. what? It's early September. It's a month before Kona. So, okay, yeah. we'll work on that. I'd yeah, love to see you at that starting line. Yeah, London is September the 12th, isn't it? So that, oh, that might be tough. Yeah, yeah, that's obviously important. But, um, yeah, maybe another year. Okay. Um, you know, I, I find it interesting. I was, I was reading another thing that said that as a kid, you loved watching sports on TV, but, you know, a lot of people root for the underdogs, but you didn't, you always liked the favorites. Yeah, I did. I always wanted the favorites win. I don't know why. Um, that's what Johnny always says. He said, yeah, he, I knew you were weird. You always wanted the best person to win. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, I don't know why that was. And with Johnny, are you guys still roommates? And, uh, or do you guys have your own places now that you're gathering too many medals to, to fit in one house? Um, yeah, well, up till about six months ago, we both lived in the same house. Um, my house. J Johnny lived rent-free, rate-free. Um, <laughs> he, uh, didn't, he didn't charge you to, for being a training partner? No, he didn't. That, that's the kind of argument he'd come up with, actually, if I asked him that. Um, but no, he, he bought his own house a, that about six months ago, so he's moved out. It's not very far away, about half a mile up the road. So, yeah, obviously we're still trading together all the time, but we've just got a bit more space. It's really, you guys train pretty much every training workout together when you're both healthy. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, literally every single session, whether it's a 30-minute jog or a hard track session or a, a four-hour bike ride. 
So how do you complement each other? I mean, is one, one guy more driven to get to the pool, the other guy pushing the pace on the bike, or how do you, how do, you do that? Um, Johnny is the one who's driven to be everywhere on time, so uh, Johnny <laughs> tends to keep us on time a bit better. He, he likes to be at the pool on time. If we're going to meet for a bike ride, he'll be there at half past nine. I'm quite happy to rock up at you know, 25 to or 22 or something. Um, and so Johnny's a bit more driven that way. But I think when it actually comes to the training, I'm probably more driven in the sessions to uh, push really hard and train as hard as I can. So that, we probably complement each other quite well like that. Any top young American ITU hopefuls you see out there on the horizon? Does anybody out there impress you? Um, I don't know too much about the Americans. Obviously, there was Zephyrus yesterday. Yeah, he was dead. Uh, Tommy, who seemed like he was yeah, anxious he to mix it up swim, in the front. Swims very well. Um, he's one of those guys that should really kind of look at working on his bike and trying to uh, go work, off the front. Work, well, yeah, go off the front, push it. You know that he, he seems like his run isn't great there at the moment. So you know why not try and push it on the swim bike? Um, obviously, I know a bit about Lucas Fabricus. Um, He's a possible hopeful. Um, I don't know too much about any of Americans. Either do we, so that's okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Hopefully by 2016. So Rio, Rio, yeah. Rio is your next major goal. Uh, uh, yeah, I suppose I mean, major goal. It's a, it's a long way away, um, which is fantastic. You know, it gives you a bit of time. But there's a World Series every year. That's good. We've got a Commonwealth Games next year as well, which is, is nice because I've never had the chance to do a Commonwealth Games before. Um, so I suppose that's important. And then Rio, hoping, hoping that there'll be a relay in Rio as well. That'd be really cool. A what? A relay. Oh, uh, yeah. Have you guys heard relay. about that? They're yeah. talking about adding a relay to the Olympics. It'll be yeah. basically a four-person relay, and it's really short, right? Yeah, yeah, really short. It's fantastic to watch. It's like a 300-meter a swim, about a six- or seven-kilometer bike, and then a two-kilometer run. And it's a format, so there's a, a woman, man, woman, man, so from every country, uh, two women, two men. Um, and they're hoping to add that onto the Olympic um, program, which, which would be obviously fantastic for triathlon, having another medal, but it's, it's good to watch as well. Fast action takes just over an hour. Um, great to race in as well, but deceptively hard. Yeah. yeah, and it would be so each person would do the swim, bike, run, and tag off to the next yeah, person. Yeah, yeah, sorry, that's right. Very yeah, so, so the first woman starts, um, dives in, does the whole triathlon, then hands over to a man, and then hands over to the woman, and then hands over to the last man. Okay, I saw that your favorite post-ride treat or Frey Bentos. What the <laughs> heck is that? Um, that's just like a pie that comes in a, in a can. Um, the it sounds <laughs> yummy already. <laughs> the a you, pie that comes in a can. That you, the you kind of take the lid off and then stick in the oven. And it's very, very unhealthy by British standards, but it'd probably be in a health food shop here, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, you guys are, you know, you and Johnny are the two most dominant short course guys around. And Chrissy Wellington won 13, you know, Ironman and Ironman distance titles in her four or five years of racing. What's going on in England with triathlon? And do you see another generation of, of young guys coming up who are going to be battling you coming up soon? Yeah, I'm not sure what's happened in England. Um, and we get asked this a lot. But I, and I think, you know, the reason why Johnny and me have had some success is completely different to the reason why Chrissy's had success. You know, we've, we've been benefited from races, from being young, uh, benefited from having a program there and coaches and a, and a system and people to train with. And, you know, Chrissy didn't. She had nothing to do with races or, or a system of any, any case. So right. it's completely different. I, I suppose triathlon having a bit of a higher profile gradually helps. It drags more people into the sport and that's quite a big effect. Um, and I think, yeah, there, there is quite a few of the young people coming up at the moment, um, especially in the women. I think we've got some pretty strong, good, uh, good young women coming up, and um, triathlon's pretty strong in Britain at the moment. Love it. And you're, you guys just signed a deal, longer-term deal with Boardman Bikes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we have. Um, Boardman Bikes have been a fantastic company, actually. Um, I don't know if you know who Chris Boardman is. He's like a bit of a... A one-hour record, right, yeah, on the track? Yeah, one-hour record holder. He's a bit of a British hero, really. Um, and very, very famous for making aerodynamic bikes. <laughs> uh, for in his heyday, you know, he kind of made bikes out of all sorts to make the best bikes he could for his record attempts. Won an Olympic gold medal on the track. Um, and we've been... I've been sponsored by Boardman Bikes for six years now, so... It's great to be involved in a company for that long. And they're, they're good bikes as well. Really, really nice. And you and Johnny are working on an, uh, a, uh, a book? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we are. Um, 
that's been an interesting process writing an autobiography um, especially when you're 24 years old exactly that's what that's what I said <laughs> Uh, you know, when I first started and someone said, do you want to write an autobiography? I was like, you're having a laugh. I can't fill a book. It's uh, <laughs> 100,000 words. <laughs> um, but, um, yeah, you'd be surprised, actually, how much you can put in it. Oh, well, yeah, you've, you've done a lot of race. How many races do you think you've done? Um, I don't know if you got it down. I, uh, a lot. Um, I guess probably going on 30, 40 ITU races. But yeah. outside that, there'll be... At least that again. So I'll be over 100, I reckon. Yeah, you're probably about 100 yeah. races. Love that. How about a big round of applause for Mr. Alistair Brownlee? 